I'm Kim Swift, and I was a level designer and the team lead on Portal. And I'm Eric Wilpon, I was a writer on Portal. So uh, we're here to talk to you today a little bit about our techniques for integrating narrative and design, sort of phrased as a portal postmortem, giving examples of, of what we particularly did. So uh, in case you were wondering, postmortem means we will be talking about stuff that's in the game. So if you haven't played the game and you're one of those people that gets all squealy and upset, you know, whenever someone tells you something that you hadn't heard uh, about a game, uh, then you, know, you might want to leave the room. Uh, or, you know, or not, that's fine too. So here's what we're going to try and cover today. First of all, I'm going to make a real brief case of why you should care about anything we're going to tell you. Uh, secondly, I'm going to go real quickly into our narrative philosophy, which is sort of uh, our crackpot theory of how uh, gameplay and narrative uh, should be combined. And third of all, we're going to talk about how we took the crackpot theory and tried to uh, apply it to our development process. So in particular, why should you care about how we did this on Portal? Well, first of all, we had a really small team with about only 10, 10 people at once working on the game. Uh, usually it was anywhere between like five and seven. Um, and it's been pretty popular uh, and, you know, we're surprised. Uh, and, uh, you know, despite the game being kind of unorthodox. So uh, after all is said and done, we actually don't really have any regrets. Uh, unlike this poor guy. <laughs> so, uh, you know, now why would you care about how we put together our narrative and design? So, by itself, our story, you know, wouldn't really make a whole, you know, great novel. You know, don't get me wrong, the, the dialogue's just really, really funny. He's probably about the funniest man you'll ever meet, just in case you were wondering. Setting the bar pretty high for the talk. So. <laughs> Sorry about that. Nothing funny in the <laughs> <laughs> so and, uh, David's no ad limiting now from that point on. <laughs> and, uh, you know, on its own, uh, the gameplay, it'd be all right, um, but honestly, a little on the dry side. Honestly, it would be a race to see which one would fail the fastest on its own. Uh, but because we had a really tight integration of both our story and our gameplay, it seemed to really resonate with people, and, you know, it worked. And like Kim said, our team size kind of imposed a lot of constraints on our design choices. Uh, so our design methods from the beginning had to be low impact on both our time and energy budgets. Um, but this kind of helped us creatively sidestep a lot of our constraints. For instance, uh, you know, Gladys being a disembodied voice might not have actually occurred to us if we'd had a ton of animators and a ton of resources to make her a little robot buddy that followed you around or something. And yet it kind of turned out to be just the, the, the perfect solution to uh, 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 the narrative and portal. So here's a crackpot theory. The idea is that games tell two stories. There's a story story, which is sort of the sum total of the game's dialogue and cutscenes, and then there's the gameplay story, which is the story described by the actions the player takes in the game world. And if you lower the delta between those two stories, the closer you put them together, the more satisfying your game will be, or at least that was our theory. There's a lot of games that I think suffer from a high story delta, but uh, since the Game Developers Conference, if I run down a lot of them, it's going to be like super dick move. So I'm yeah. not going to do that. Uh, we don't really want to die today. Yeah, I'm going to mention one game that I actually like a lot, so it should be non-controversial, and it's also kind of old, uh, is Clive Barker's Undying, which is a first-person shooter that was released like six years ago. And it's a good shooter, and uh, regardless of what you may think about his style, Clive Barker, and that's him wearing a super scary pair of pants. He's a, <laughs> he's a talented writer who actually, in interviews, I think seems to care a lot about the story in his games. So uh, Clive Barker's Undying, you play this World War I uh, war hero who goes to Scotland to visit the castle of one of your uh, war buddies. And uh, the castle is sort of infested with ghouls. Ooh. Yeah, and you're shooting a lot of monsters, and there's a lot of death and destruction all around. But pretty frequently, as you're going through the mansion, the game all of a sudden stops to play one of these cutscenes where you sort of calmly interrogate one of the members of the staff. You know, you're sort of, you know, what do you do? How are you, how are you doing? How are you feeling? Stuff like that. 
Meanwhile, at no point does your character just grab the help by the label and say, you know, like, there are monsters five feet around that corner killing everyone they come across. You need to run now. The two stories make absolutely no sense when you smush them together. And idea, or I'm Dying is one of the first times that I remember uh, a good game sort of being uh, undermined by a disconnect between the story the gameplay was telling and the story the story itself was telling. So, with all that in mind, uh, our fundamental portal narrative design goal was that the story story would never ever intrude or contradict the gameplay story. For us, less was always more, and we were ruthless about it. We were ruthless about trimming the narrative fat, tightening our belts, and then trimming it even more. Portal was going to be a lean storytelling machine if it killed us, and usually it meant killing you, killing me, because it was a lot of good lines that had to get cut. And we're really sorry about but it. But it was, yeah, it was worth. So uh, enough about how we feel about games. Like, let's talk about how we practically applied these feelings. Uh, first of all, we're going to talk a little bit about our playtesting process, which, by the way, in case you were wondering, it's really important. Uh, second, uh, reflecting story in your environment. Uh, next, evolving narrative out of gameplay. And then again, vice versa, evolving gameplay out of narrative. So uh, playtesting is probably the most important thing we ever did on Portal. Um, you know, actually sit down and watch people play your game. Don't just, you know, have some other company play test the game and then send your report afterwards. It's, you know, just not going to be as valuable to you as just sitting down, having someone play your game, and you watch them and see how they react to it. Um, you can find out what your players actually want by watching them. Um, in the case of Portal, we adjusted our gameplay to what players looked like they needed. Did they need more training? Because clearly they were really confused here. Um, you know, maybe they needed me, like some more reinforcement of what we trained them on because uh, they wanted to use those new, new skills. Um, and in addition to that, we also adjusted our story to, what, to enhance, essentially, what our players were feeling at that time. Yeah, and uh, frequent play tests help keep this objective about uh, our design decisions. Uh, watching playtests is a great way to expose pretty quickly what isn't working. One rule we had narrative-wise was at the end of a playtest, we would ask playtesters to just tell us the portal story back, beat by beat. And if they couldn't tell it to us, we took that as a real clear sign that they just weren't interested, that we were failing. And the fix for it almost always was just to cut more story, cut more exposition. Uh, it usually meant cutting something that initially seemed... Uh, essential to the story, and as it turned out, it just made it stronger every time we cut something. It says something about yeah. the writing. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, another thing is playtest early and often. Uh, on the far side there, you can see uh, what the first room in the game actually looked like, uh, you know, maybe like a couple weeks into development. And then on the other side, you can see what it finally shipped, you know, as. And uh, we literally started play testing this room the first week that we got to Valve and started working on the game. We, you know, hacked portals together in some horrible way that, you know, we're glad doesn't exist anymore. Uh, and uh, we were already making better decisions about what our levels were like. Um, so I don't know, it's kind of hard to make out. But in the first picture, there's kind of like this shimmery force field, which was, you know, the original cage for the player. And we got rid of this pretty quickly because our playtesters, you know, just didn't understand what it was. They would, you know, walk up to the, to, to the force field and they, you know, were wondering why they couldn't walk through it. So they would just kind of like trace the edge of the cage like five times and get really confused. So we changed it to glass just to fix that problem. So, you know, not only did uh, our playtesting help us get a better narrative and get better gameplay, it also helped us refine our art direction. You know, as you can notice uh, in the later picture, it's a, a lot cleaner, it's a lot simpler. Uh, we extracted any of the elements that, you know, didn't really have any relevance to the player, and it really helped us uh, teach the players what they needed to know. So as just kind of a digression, uh, yeah, I, I labeled this slide advice because this is the only one I'm fully behind as advice of anything we're going to say today. This is, this is actually good advice. Uh, if you're writing a funny game, uh, first of all, God help you because it's, it's, it's unpleasant. Because tough guy dialogue is just about as macho the 50th time you hear it as the uh, first time. Whereas funny dialogue is funny once, maybe. Uh, about three years ago, 
I worked on a game called Psychonauts that I Yay! helped write. Yay! There's more people clapping than bought it. So. <laughs> so, um, uh, now I lost my train of thought. Working at Psychonauts, Double Fine. Oh, so Double Fine uh, is kind of structured. Everybody sits in one big room. It was 40, 40 people maybe sitting in one big room. And it's, you know, the two and a half years that I was there, well, you no know, game development. It's 12 hours a day, six, seven days a week. And so I had to sit there in the middle of this pit of people working on Psychonauts, hearing my supposedly funny dialogue blaring out of 40 monitors to just grim, stony silence. Uh, and it was just, it's, it was torture. It was psychological torture <laughs> for me, because Tim wisely had his own office somewhere where you didn't have to hear the grim, stony silence. Uh, so, yeah, so this is you writing a funny game. Uh, you are going to exist in a black cloud of despair for however long it takes you to make the game. But so here's the advice. <laughs> Trust your instincts. Uh, try and remember your initial reaction, people's initial reactions to seeing it, and, uh, you know, do whatever you can do to not despair. But the, the fourth part, the part that helped us a lot, again, on Portal is playtest. The more often you playtest, the more often you actually get to see someone see, hearing your dialogue, seeing the game for the first time. And it, honest to God, whatever the benefits of playtesting are for the design team, for a writer, it is the only way really to maintain your sanity during the, the two or three years it's going to take you to make the game. Or Prozac. Yeah, and I'll, I'll, I'll yeah, medication. So, uh, Another thing we tried to do when we had to cut exposition was to, uh, if we didn't want to cut it all together, was to try and embed exposition in the environment. Um, when we were initially talking about it, we had some email uh, ideas for embedding in an email, and we were actually using email to talk about putting in an email, and at some point we discovered that reading email wasn't actually that fun. Uh, no. It was like, did, did you enjoy reading that last email? I was like, no, it wasn't that exciting. We should, probably shouldn't put it in the game. Um, <laughs> So that was one of our rules. And the idea was try and be creative about reflecting the story in the environment. And again, easy to say be creative, but uh, if you apply a rule set and then you're ruthless about the rules, uh, it's amazing how creative you can get in a big hurry if it's a choice between coming up with some novel way to embed your exposition in the environment and simply cutting it all together. So what we did in Portal, uh, at least one of the things we did, was to have these little wall scribblings in the behind-the-scenes areas of the game. And honestly, these were really quick and easy to do. Like, they really only took, like, one or two days tops. And they were pretty effective at telling a story. So uh, here's an example of the room. And, you know, put yourself in the position of your characters. What would they do in, in the situation of the game? So in this case, uh, we had this idea for a character that we called the Rat Man. And, uh, you know, he was supposed to be a fellow escaped test subject, just like you, and he's, you know, a little, little loopy. And uh, we originally wanted you to actually meet this NPC at some point in the game, but, you know, we had uh, two artists, so <laughs> it wasn't really feasible. So it, rather than just sort of cut our, our backstory on this guy, we decided to, you know, manifest him here in these rooms. So, you know, I asked myself if I was trapped inside an insidious facility bent on my destruction run by a homicidal AI, what would I do to pass the time? So uh, another big tool we used was to try and evolve our narrative out of gameplay. Uh, like Kim said, we tried to write to enhance what play testers were feeling, which required me to try and keep the story as wet as possible. It was a big, big hurdle to overcome to just not get attached to any piece of writing. And, uh, yeah, because it was just going to disappear at any given time, and we'd have to think up something else. And the same goes for gameplay, too. Don't get too attached to anything. Like, you know, you might need to cut it, and it's probably for the best. Um, so here's an example of that, like, the way to Companion Cube. Uh, so we're going to 
talk about this first from a game design standpoint of one day we sat down and decided we wanted to make what we called the box marathon level. So where essentially you've got your cube at the beginning of the map and then you take it all the way through to the end of the map and put it on a button. It's supposed to be a big, long obstacle course. Um, so the first thing that we tried was having sort of this moving platform, you know, over a goo pit where you'd have to stand on it with your box and avoid stuff. Uh, kind of similar, actually, to the last test chamber that we shipped. Um, and you know what? It pissed players off, like, to no end. Uh, they would end up destroying the box by dropping it in the goo, and they'd get really annoyed because they had to go back to the beginning of the map, and, you know, they didn't really want to carry this stupid thing with them everywhere. So we went back to the drawing board. Uh, the first thing we did was remove the, the moving platforms over the goo, you know, so you couldn't destroy the box. And uh, we added more gameplay events where having the box is necessary for you to solve the puzzle. So here's a couple examples. Uh, on one, one side there, you can see that we use the cube to you know, kind of make a dynamic set of stairs there to get up those platforms. And then on the other side, uh, it's a puzzle where you have to you know, put the box on one of these buttons and then you know, go stand in another button and get this energy ball through those doors into a you know, catcher thing. And these work pretty well uh, in terms of making players at least somewhat take the box with them and not hate it. Um, and, uh, but, you know, players were still kind of forgetting it. They'd leave it at one puzzle and then, you know, go to the next puzzle and go, oh, crap, and then have to go back to the beginning and grab their box. Um, so we said, okay, maybe if we re redesign this room so that way you're always kind of facing this button and taking a look at it. So that, that worked pretty well, at least, to, to remind players, by the way, you need this at the end of the map. But, you know, we needed something else. Like, players really weren't getting that attached to the box, and there were still a few people that would kind of forget it behind. And so, Eric to the rescue over here. Uh, though, as much as possible, we tried to, you know, put hints for our players, you know, in the environment, whether it be through lighting or geometry. You know, when all else fails, great dialogue really was a great tool for us to give uh, a hint to the player. Yeah, I'd been reading luckily, these uh, declassified government interrogation manuals. And one of the things, uh, they're, they're awesome. I recommend them. They put it up on the screen. They're really cool. Um, but one of the things they talked about was that uh, isolation leads uh, interrogation subjects to start uh, becoming attached to inanimate objects. And kind of just something clicked. It was like, well, you're sort of alone this whole time. Uh, and maybe if uh, Gladys psychologically needles you a little bit, you know, uh, it would work. And crazily, I mean, they, they know what they're doing. They're government interrogation specialists. They were right. It, <laughs> yeah, it, it totally super worked. super duper work. <laughs> no one ever forgot their box after we put in that dialogue, that's for sure. And uh, sort of as an afterthought, you know, we put these pink hearts, they're so pretty, on, on the cube just to kind of cue back to the dialogue that there's something special about this box and you should take it with you and take care of it. Yeah, that worked. Um, and uh, honestly, this was a really great thing for us just, uh, just because it, it had a dual function uh, as far as the ending of this map went. Uh, and the first thing is, well, at the time that we were finishing up this map, uh, we were also working on our ending boss battle, and we had settled at the time on just disintegrating these little parts of, of Gladys. And uh, we had an incinerator in the map, and uh, we didn't train our players. So obviously they had no idea what they were doing, and uh, you know they'd have to press the switch to open up the incinerator, and they just they completely ignored it. And then they would wander around the room, and they'd get really angry at us. So uh, we obviously had to train this somewhere, and we had a great idea of where to put the training. Yeah, uh, originally, up until almost the last minute, at the end of the companion cube level, you just had to just leave the companion cube. You had to abandon it because you couldn't bring it with you into the elevator, and Gladys made some reference to it being euthanized. And it was sort of sad, but it wasn't really a good ending to the level. Uh, so uh, putting the incinerator there and having you be forced to euthanize it was just a an awesome way to end it. <laughs> and, and in addition to that, it was also a great place to train the player because there was no stress. There was no pressure for... Well, the, the stress of killing it. Well, yeah, it was a little stressful. But, but, but more like, you know, there was nothing shooting at you or, you know, they didn't have a clock ticking down like, oh my god, I've got to do this in ten seconds. Um, and we did that because, well, players do not learn anything when they're completely stressed out. Like, they just, they just won't absorb anything. 
so putting the training there was, was pretty good. Um, also, it provided a really great uh, point to our narrative as well because, you know, you get to incinerate Gladys the same way, she, you know, she made you incinerate your best friend. Yeah, the whole Companion Cube saga was just a really great example of how uh, the gameplay kind of influenced the story, which then turned around and influenced the gameplay. Okay, so having said all that about how it's gameplay, 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 no narrative, we did reach a point where we discovered that gameplay wasn't really working by itself. Uh, and the, this was the original ending of Portal. Uh, honestly, the biggest obstacle to us when making Portal was our ending boss battle. Um, you know, we look at other games, okay, we know what a boss battle will look like in a first-person shooter or an RPG, but what in the world is a, pu a boss battle going to look like in a weird environmental puzzle game? Yeah, the first thing you'd think, or at least the first thing we thought, was that the boss monster for a puzzle game should be a deviously complex puzzle. And that sort of innocuous sounding conclusion really just gave us a lot of headaches and pain. Uh, so we're going to show you a few examples of some things that we tried uh, as boss battles and eventually abandoned for one reason or another. So the first one that we tried was James Bond lasers. So. Uh, uh, literally, like they, they were big giant lasers that would follow the player around trying to, to zap them. And uh, we, you know, obviously we cut this. Um, here's, I know, aren't they pretty? Isn't that nice? Um, these are training maps that we had for the, the James Bond style lasers, where essentially you'd have to place your portal in front of the laser and then, you know, place one on a wall and then redirect the laser at that weird orange thing sitting in that glass wall. Um, and, you know, break through and be able to get to the other side where you would meet Gladys. That's Gladys there in her giant shimmery cube phase. Uh, don't you love temp art? It's great stuff. Um, and once again, you'd have to redirect those lasers at those, you know, which you find out are orange plugs supplying Gladys with power. And, uh, you know, the end. But, yeah, it was not good. Um, the lasers were extremely boring to dodge um, and kind of difficult to tune because we would make them follow the player kind of fast and then it would be unfair and if we you know, slowed them down, then they're boring. Uh, they were also really difficult to aim, believe it or not, through a portal. It was kind of a pain. And it was also hard to tell if you were hit by the lasers too. So, you know, we abandoned this idea and instead chose to use a rocket launcher. So uh, the second attempt that we had was Portal Combat. <laughs> um, sorry, I, I had fun with Photoshop one day. Um, <laughs> so uh, you know, we had a lot of players, uh, you know, test our game that were hardcore first-person shooter players. So they were like, "We need more action, and and uh, you need to jump around and be a crazy Portal Ninja." And and so we were like, oh, "Yeah, okay, sure, we'll give it a shot." And, uh, you know, it didn't really work out very well. Uh, here's a picture of a, a level that we actually shipped in the game. And this is what it originally looked like. So uh, this was supposed to be the first time that you would meet Gladys. And uh, you can see that there's a rocket launcher there. We had put it in at that point. And you would have to redirect your portal, you know, port bleh, redirect the rockets and use your portals to, you know, shoot Gladys in the face. But then uh, that's Gladys, yeah. She's a bunch of roller mines. Um, so, uh, you know, this, this was, you know, it was okay. But uh, we then made it a little bit more complex. So she would rise to the top of this room, uh, and then all of these little pillboxes would pop open with turrets in them. And the rocket launcher was still on, and you'd have to try and, you know, redirect the laser and hit her again. And all the meanwhile, the turrets are firing at you, the rocket launcher's firing at you, and just, just not fun. So, yeah, the, the high-intensity gameplay sucked. Uh, in fact, it sucked so bad that I'm talking when you're supposed to be reading. Is that true? No, no, no. it's your... All right. So anyway, I'll finish. It, it, it sucked. <laughs> it was bad. It sucked so much, I, I, well, I'm not going to let Kim talk about it. It sucked because I, I hated it so much. No one paid attention to Gladys, uh, uh, any of her dialogue, because there was just way too much stuff going on. 
And we had playtesters who come in who were sort of hardcore Counter-Strike or shooter fans, and they were able to wring a little bit of enjoyment out of it. But the vast majority of our playtesters uh, who had sort of gotten used to the slower-paced, cerebral nature of Portal uh, were just frustrated and confused and uh, dissatisfied, which was absolutely not the way we kind of wanted to send them out the door. So uh, the final attempt was to have a chase sequence. <laughs> And uh, that's Gladys there is the kitten. Isn't she cute? So uh, here's kind of what that looked like. This is actually a continuation of uh, the previous section where, you know, Gladys would rise up to the top of the ceiling. Well, after you hit her with the second rocket, she'd rise up even more and would zoom down this hallway. And you would actually have to follow her uh, and by, you know, flinging a couple times and, you know, getting up into this hallway. Uh, and honestly, the pacing was just horrible. Horrible, because you know players wouldn't necessarily see where she would go, and so they didn't know where they were going. So they would wander around for a while, and they'd eventually realize, oh, I don't think I've been there before, and you know, kind of get up there. But you know, if it's a chase sequence, it's supposed to be action packed. You're supposed to be going, 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 and you know, instead players are just wandering around confused. Uh, and then once you actually got up into this hallway, uh, we wanted to make it seem like, oh, Gladys had sprung some sort of trap and, uh, and to, to kill you. Uh, so we had all these pistons kind of like break out of the walls and, you know, try and crush you or, you know, block you from getting further. And uh, we also, you know, had these turrets and stuff pop down from the ceiling. And if you actually played the game, you can see that these hallways are kind of similar to what we shipped, but, we, you know, we took a lot of stuff out. Um, because... Yeah, this, I'm not even going to bother reading down. This failed uh, in every way it's possible for a level like that to fail. It, it had bad pacing. Uh, players didn't really know what was going on. Was Gladys making the, the pistons come out at you? And every solution we came up with to try and fix those were either too expensive for us to do or just made the gameplay even worse. So a uh, complex boss battle, uh, yeah, it didn't work. Uh, and the thing that we actually learned from all this was that the more complex that we made our puzzles, the slower the pacing actually got, because players would have to stop and think about what they were going to do next. And, you know, if you watch an action movie and, and, you know, you get to the climactic sequence, there's something happening all the time. And in our game, when we wanted it to be climactic, um, because we made everything, you know, more complex, it did the opposite thing than what we expected. So, uh, it's, it's funny to us now, but we were desperately screwed at this point, because episode two was winding Wrap up, up, and TF, after ten years, was going to beat us out. And, uh, <laughs> and, you know, the episode two guys are running around, they're like, our final battle is going to be a hundred striders, and you're going to be driving a car and running into little mini striders. They're like, what are you guys doing? Like, it's a secret. <laughs> so... Uh, so, but again, once again, our old friend playtesting helped us. There, there was a point, and we, I don't know why we didn't realize it earlier on, but there was one piece of feedback that we were getting, that there was a point in the game that playtesters uh, felt, <coughs> excuse me, was both climactic and satisfying, and it's uh, the fire pit. It happened uh, about two-thirds of the way through the game, uh, the testing uh, proper, the regular testing. Hold on, I'm going to take a drink of water. Uh, is almost over, and Gladys is kind of talking you out. You're riding this uh, this platform into a fire pit, and uh, and you eventually you escape out of here. But playtesters were just consistently telling us not only was this dramatic and exciting, they they kept telling us that it was actually like it was a really tough puzzle that I felt super satisfied to uh, to solve which absolutely made no sense to us. <laughs> because... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know, it's a good thing. <laughs> portal, portal 2 is just going to be this picture over and over. Uh, when it comes right down to it, at that point in the game, that's about the easiest puzzle in Portal. Uh, you place a portal on the wall next to the fire pit, and then you place one in the safe area, and you just hop through it. And that's it. So we, we then had to sit down and reflect 
Like, what in the world made this so climactic? Um, and one of the things that we learned was that, well, it had time pressure. Uh, you know, there was only a limited amount of time while you were on that platform before you were going to get burned alive to place your portals and, and escape. Uh, and, you know, as I, I think I've said before, you know, time pressure makes people think something that is a, a lot more complicated than it actually is. Uh, another thing was it had a really high visual impact. I mean, you can't really go wrong with a platform heading straight into a giant pit of fire for visual impact. And, uh, you know, it's something that our players had never seen before in the game, and so it was, you know, something new. It was also a dramatic high point because uh, for the first time, GLaDOS is... Uh, pretty openly trying to kill you and also for the first time you're able to assert a little bit of control over your environment and escape from her and uh, like Kim was saying the tie all of those three things combined made it so that an easy puzzle was sort of feeling like a much more complicated puzzle uh, <clears throat> which allowed us led us to the realization that we've been holding on to this idea that we needed a complex puzzle at the end and it simply just wasn't true so here's what we actually shipped in the game as boss battle. Uh, you can see Gladys there with her little personality spheres, and then next to her uh, was a hatch where a rocket launcher would pop up, and you'd have to reorient the rockets and hit Gladys, take one of those spheres, and then uh, put it in the incinerator by you know getting to the activation switch uh, with your portals, and then getting back to the incinerator and tossing it in. The end. Done. So, taking the, the four lessons we learned, this is how we applied them to the final Gladys battle. First of all, it was time pressure. Uh, we were ourselves under some time pressure, so instead of getting fancy, we actually just had a timer counting down to something that would kill you. And uh, we decided that thing that would kill you would be some neurotoxin because it was also really cheap just to make a green particle system. <laughs> uh, you laugh, but it's seriously yeah, true. hundred percent true. <laughs> Um, so, you know, visual impact. Well, on one side of the screen, you know, on the far side over there, uh, you can see a piece of concept art that an artist at Valve, uh, Jason Brashel, did for us. Thanks, Jason. And on the other side there, you can see what we actually shipped. So everything in this room, visually, is pointing at Gladys. Uh, you know, got the geometry of the stairs leading up to her, got all the lights pointing at her. You know, after all this time of hearing Gladys heckle you and harass you, you know, we wanted to make this room have some serious impact. And, uh, you know, I think it did its job pretty well. And, you know, it's, it's not like any other room in the game. And so I think it really gave players a, a sense of satisfaction. Uh, and then in terms of a high dramatic moment, putting some time pressure to the puzzle made it so that I only had to write, like, six minutes of decent dialogue, which is in stark contrast to all our previous uh, attempts, which required me to write infinity minutes of uh, excellent dialogue. Which makes Eric cry. Yeah, that was, that was a, a bad time for me, writing the infinity minutes of dialogue. And finally, the easy puzzle. Uh, you know, when all is said and done, Portal is a, a, a puzzle game, but all the things that we learned led us back towards, you know, we need to simplify this puzzle. So adding time pressure and then, you know, having it be a very dramatic room and have a lot of uh, really interesting points made by Gladys, uh, scaling back the puzzle allowed players to really absorb this moment and have a good time. And, uh, you know... Honestly, at least for me, there's nothing more frustrating than getting to the finale of a game and not being able to, to beat that stupid boss battle and see the ending of the game, which, in our case, we really wanted people to see, or rather hear. Uh, <laughs> so we wanted to leave players, you know, with a real sense of, of satisfaction and, you know, scratch that. We wanted players to feel genuinely happy and leave the game with a smile on their face. So, yeah, we sat down, we kind of made a list of what makes people happy and then we kind of made a list of what we could put in a game and then put it into Excel and pivot table and, and uh, <laughs> catchy song kind of floated to the top. And this is Jonathan Colton who uh, we got to write our catchy song. Who is wearing his best hat, by the way. And uh, so, you know, when all is said and done, a lot of this actually came out of our constraints. You know, we had a small team, we had a limited amount of time, and, you know, frankly, we just couldn't make a giant FMV epic finale of, of Doom. And, you know, the cost to happiness ratio of putting a song over some scrolling text was really high. So, uh, 
the moral of the whole thing for us was just try to fully embrace your constraints as fuel for creativity. Honestly, without the constraints that we had, I truly believe Portal would not be uh, as good a game as it turned out to be. And in addition to that, you know, have faith in yourself, uh, have faith in your writing, and uh, and in the skills of your team because you know they're your best resources, you know. And uh, once again, play test, play test, play test, and when you're done with that, play test some more because honestly, you will get the most valuable information for your game out of watching your play tests, and it'll make for a better player experience in the end. That's it. So, <laughs> so we uh, deliberately kind of kept our, our talk short because you know we kind of assumed people had questions because we keep getting asked questions, and uh, so you know we wanted to just kind of make our point and then leave the floor open to you guys to you know ask us whatever you want. So, questions. You oh, wait, on the bug. Is there a microphone? Oh, I'm pointing at that guy. Oh, okay. Okay, fine. Can you hear me again? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so my question is you talked earlier on uh, not using emails or voice recording for like that for like story segments in your environment. Um, and you know, for the most part, I agree, however, a lot of successful games use this a lot. Most notably Resident Evil and most recently Bioshock. And they're all bad games. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. <laughs> no, like, no, like, 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 why do you think that is? is there, do you think it's just like, is there, like, just a separation between, like, the types of players who play these games and the different ways they get out of it? And, like, that's the best place that Oh, happens? yeah, I have no idea. None of these were, are actually prescriptive. You know, go, go, go for it if you want to. It was just a personal choice we made. I think it, it can work. I just personally, I don't like. I don't, I, I mean, for me, I, I don't like to read that much. I don't like to read uh, in games. I mean, I like to read books. But when I'm in a game, I just want it to kind of happen and, and, and me not have to read that much. And, and Eric, you know, we were talking about this before, and Eric made a really good point, which was, you know, how often do you use a voice recorder to leave secret messages for your friends and family? Well, I mean, yeah, that's the thing. These futuristic games, there's always like, oh, we're in the future, and everybody's leaving messages on PDAs. I can go buy a PDA for $8 at Best Buy now, and, and nobody's using it to, to deliver messages to me ever. So, yeah, we just, so that, that's our own personal hang up with those two things, but I think they're fine in games. Uh, oh. Guys standing at the mic? Oh, there's yeah. people at mic. <laughs> I guess isn't plugged in, so if I start stand here anyway, it looked like a good place to stand. Yeah, it's a great place to stand, yeah. I gotta say. Um, I want to ask this question because I thought it was exactly the type of thing that I think of Eric normally really against. Why does uh, Gladys have an incinerator in her room, other than just... <laughs> <laughs> There's actually kind of a funny story. Uh, uh, so the question was, why does Gladys uh, have an incinerator sitting in her room? And uh, the, the answer is actually kind of fun. Uh, like, uh, we were talking sort of like a backstory, and they wanted to, like... So they created this giant AI, and they weren't really sure at Aperture Science if she was going to go out of control. So they made this room so that way, you know, if she did completely lose her mind, they could, you know, incinerate her and get rid of her. Right. There's, uh, a, there's a red phone in there that is supposed to be there was a guy who that was his job to sit there and call somebody if it looked like the AI was going rogue, and then they'd come <laughs> and throw it in the thing, and it, it, sadly, it didn't work. Nope. Uh, it, didn't it was work. bad by Aperture Science. They're sort of half geniuses, half, half morons. So. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Uh, so you mentioned uh, playtesting as a really critical step, um, but also not uh, outsourcing it to another group. How do you go about selecting and acquiring a steady supply of new players uh, throughout your process? How did you guys go about doing that? So the question was, uh, how did we go about getting new playtesters all the time to, to playtest our game? Uh, do you know how easy it is to go walk out to the nearest GameStop and say, hey, we've got this game, do you want to come play it? And I mean, you know, the answer's like, yeah, of course. Uh, and, and also we had, you know, friends and family come in and play test. Uh, Gabe's kids actually play tested for us. You going to say something? Oh, just I mean, in Valve, there's a lot of people working at Valve who were kind of heads down on their own projects, so we had a lot of people who could just come in, you know, from other parts of the company as well. And, and did you ever have people come back for, like, additional tests, or was it sort of a, you test once, and that's 
that's all the useful information. So the question was, do we have people come back and playtest again? Uh, usually we would have people playtest uh, once, but uh, we had uh, a few playtesters, mainly at Valve, uh, who seemed to really like Portal and were stubborn. So you know they wouldn't really get frustrated easily. So when we would have a puzzle that we wanted to try out that was really, really rough and we just wanted to see if the concept was good, we would usually grab one of those guys and have him sit down and chug through it. So. Thank you. Uh, hi. Hello. Oh, uh, in the uh, developer commentary, you said you there will be more portal games, and obviously, you know, your first couple sides show you know you have you're having a lot of success, and um, when that happens, you get a lot of resources. You won't be a little tiny team. So, um, what kind of are you you know afraid, or how will you overcome the challenge of not having as many constraints? Um, and next. Yeah, yeah, I know. You, have say, you have to say the question. Oh, uh, so how will we make a next portal if there is one? Uh, how, how can we keep some of our design philosophies if we have a lot more resources? And it's a good question. I don't know. I'm scared, to tell you the truth. I don't know how it's going to work. Uh, trying to just bask in the moment now without people bugging me about the next one. <laughs> Just let me enjoy it for one minute. <laughs> no, but seriously, I, I don't know. Uh, I, yeah, I don't know. A <laughs> little bit of a personal flashback for me. But um, as I remember, toward the end of Narbacular Drop, there is a puzzle where you're required to to aim through one of the doorways and put, you know, a portal on the wall on the other side, in essence, to to shoot through, um, which was very elegant as a way of I guess, pushing the the mechanics of the game um, to its limit, I suppose. And I noticed, of course, that in in Portal, um, you chose for for one reason or another, or another not to allow the player to fire the the portal gun through one portal. And I was, I can think of a couple of reasons why you might have done that, but I was just wondering if it was a, I guess, a, for technical purposes or as part of a, a larger idea of some sort. So the question was, uh, did we, so in our Bacular Drop, we, we gave players the ability of being able to shoot one portal through another portal, um, and we decided to, you know, not do that for portal because uh, not because it was, you know, technically impossible, technology-wise, you know, impossible, uh, but more for a design purpose. Like, you know, we wanted players to learn something in particular in a certain level, and so giving the players suddenly the ability to bypass all of the training that we had tried so hard to, to construct, and uh, you know, just seemed like shooting ourselves in the foot, essentially. Thank you. Um, in the uh, first trailer for Portal, uh, the portals seem to have sort of a, uh, an almost liquid quality to them. Now they're more like holes in the wall. Uh, also, they were uh, a blue and a red por portal, and now it's a blue and an orange one. Um, what uh, triggered this change? Uh, so the question was, why did we change the, the look and color of our portals? Yeah. Uh, well, honestly, we went through just a bunch of just iterations. And uh, as far as blue and orange goes, uh, you know, we liked orange better than and red. <laughs> I mean, it really just boils down to that. Like, we like the color choice better in, in the end. And, um, you know, it, we, we left it sort of up to our artists. Like, you know, what do you want the portals to look like? So... And the, um, the liquid quality? Uh, it was kind of like they were rippling at the edges. Um, yeah, so I think what you're referring to as far as the liquid quality of, of how the portals were looking was that was uh, an opening uh, shader for it. And I don't know, we just decided to change it. Like, honestly, it just sort of we decided one day. So. I just wanted to leave a comment. Um, I just want to thank you guys for the end of the turret level. Uh, the most satisfying thing that I felt in that game was was picking up that last turret and walking into the elevator through the through the field and watching it just turn into a ball of ash. And I want to <laughs> thank you guys for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. no problem. Yeah, uh, we also really like the way they scream too. When <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So I have a question. Uh, I'm a student, and uh, you guys started out as an indie developer. Uh, so I'm just wondering if you have any suggestions for students and whatnot who are hoping to get into the game industry and break in like you guys did. So the question is, do we have any uh, advice for student developers on how to break into the industry? Uh, make games. Make as many as you can uh, and fail, because honestly, failing, you'll learn a lot of stuff. Like, I can't tell you how many times we failed on our game designs working at DigiPen. Like, yeah, one of them worked out, but, you know, we had three others that were not the best games ever. Um, and, and honestly, practice makes perfect, right? So the more things that you have... Uh, on your resume and in your portfolio to show to game developers that look, I did all these projects, I worked on them from start to finish, you know, it, it obviously shows that I have commitment to, to the project, right? So make games, like whether it be a mod or, you know, a student project, just, just make as many as you possibly can and uh, have fun with them. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, when I spoke to people that also played Portal about the fire pit puzzle, one of the things that we talked about a lot was the fact that we felt like we had broken the game somehow by escaping like this final ending, and that there was this moment of, of sort of shock and confusion about what to do next when you suddenly had, had gotten past what you imagined was the game's end. And that was a very powerful moment in the way that it defied conventional game narrative. So I'm wondering if that that defying of conventional game narrative was something that was intentional in the design of the level, or whether that was just something that, that, that was an accidental occurrence from what you set up? Honestly, the, <clears throat> that was one of the very first Repeat things... the question. Oh, sorry. Uh, well, I forgot the question. I was just going to talk about <laughs> uh, No, was it intentional, uh, the sort of way that you feel maybe like you've broken the game uh, after the fire pit? And I guess there was some amount of intentionality there, because... That's one thing that virtually never changed. Uh, the beats as far as you start in the relaxation vault, at some point during the game, although I think maybe it was earlier in the game at one point, yeah, you early. escape the fire pit, and then you would eventually meet Gladys. was in there before anything. I mean, the, the, yeah. the test levels with no dialogue basically had that structure just because we had this intuitive feeling that it would work, and it just ended up working better than we thought, so we can take some credit for it, but not not total credit. Uh, it just worked really well. Thank you. Thanks. So uh, when I first heard about Portal, I went and played Nervacular Drop really thoroughly, and when I played Portal, I noticed there were a lot of similarities. The one big difference was that Portal had all this humor, uh, a profound amount of humor in it, and I was wondering what the decision was or how you decided to throw in the comedy. So the question is, why did we decide to throw in comedy uh, for Portal? Because Narbacular Drop really wasn't that funny. Uh, <laughs> and, and uh, you know, there's something inherently funny about Portals. Like, you know, especially, you know, you put one on, like, both of them on the floor, and you drop a box in, and you see it, like, popping out back and forth. Like, there's something kind of funny and visceral about it. And, and well, honestly, Eric's really damn funny. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it, given a choice, that was kind of in my comfort zone. Like, if my task at Valve was to write stuff for Portal, if nobody was going to object, I would just make it funny. Because, uh, I mean, that, that would be Thank something you. I was more likely to succeed at, honestly. Because you like despairing. Yeah. And it would be, yeah. Hi, uh, I have no problems harvesting Adam from Little Sisters. Uh, I love kicking uh, innocent bystanders to bloody pulp and lots of games. But why, why, why? Why did you have me kill off the companion key? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, why did we kill off the companion cube? Well, I, I think we explained that in the speech, didn't we? <laughs> you can thank the United States Secret Service. For <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, I don't think it was Secret Service. I'm secreter than the Secret Service. I, I have uh, two questions, and the second one's quick. Um, the first one is, it sounds like there's a lot of trial and error and rework that went into Portal. Um, did you have to do anything to smooth that over with management, uh, set their expectations or anything like that? Uh, so uh, the question is, uh, there's a lot of trial and error uh, with, with the game, obviously, and did we have to you know, convince our management that that was perhaps a good idea? Uh, and honestly, the way management works at Valve is a lot different than it does at, at other game companies. We don't really have producers there. Okay. Um, you know, we have team leads that basically, you know, 
maybe do like the administrivia stuff every once in a while and do some PR. But, you know, honestly, the people working on the game get to make the decisions about the game and have direct impact on what they're working on. And, you know, we found that it just makes for a much more, you know, satisfied group of people making games. So. Fantastic. Oh, well, also, uh, like the playtesting, the commitment to playtesting wasn't our insight. That's that's the Valve philosophy, and that's how they make games. If we hadn't done that, then we would have been in, uh, deep, in, deep, in trouble. deep, deep trouble. Yes. Okay, fantastic. Second question, um, is GLaDOS still alive, and when will we see her again? <laughs> still alive. Gladys. So the question is, is Gladys still alive, and when will we see her again? Uh, well, uh, did you not listen to the last yeah. song or the game? The song is called <laughs> Still Alive. That's kind of a failure of writing, if you don't know that she's still alive. 100% still alive, thank you. <laughs> and as far as when you'll see her again, yeah, who knows? All right, hi. Um, I had a question about your development background and how you guys scored yourself like an awesome seat by working with Valve. Uh, so, what were you still making a question or? Well, no, go ahead. Oh, okay. Uh, so, so <laughs> How'd the you question. Guys yourself like a position to work with Valve. Uh, so the question was, how did we end up like hooking up with Valve to to make Portal? Um, so uh, as far as like the team goes, with the exception of Eric, uh, we were all students at DigiPen Institute of Technology, and we created a game called Nerbacular Drop, which was our student project uh, for our senior year, and. Uh, it was, you know, the predecessor, predecessor to Portal. You know, you had two portals on the wall, and it was an environmental puzzle game. And uh, every year, Digipen has an expo for graduating seniors. And Valve came by, took a look at, at our project, and thought it was interesting enough to drag us over to Valve and have us present the game to Gabe Newell. And uh, after about 15 minutes through our presentation, uh, Gabe, you know, told us to be quiet and then asked us uh, what we were planning on doing after we graduated and we were like well hopefully you know paying our loans getting a job eating food uh, <laughs> and uh, and you know he offered us a job on the, so on the spot essentially to come in and create portal uh, using a source engine and you know uh, that's how we ended up there and, and Eric's got a different story yeah but Pretty, I worked. Uh, I'd been just doing a lot of writing, and then I went and I worked at Double Fine for a couple of years, and then I left Double Fine, and I was just back to freelance writing. And I, for me, it was just I got a mail one day from Gabe Newell and said, "Do you want to come work at Valve?" <laughs> <laughs> I have another quick question. Yeah, pro yeah. Oh, um, go ahead. Why didn't you guys submit this to IGF? It seems like a perfect candidate. So was it, was it the reason because you guys got you know picked up by Valve or? So uh, Narbac. So okay, the question was why didn't we submit the game to IGF? Uh, so Narbacular Drop actually was in the IGF Student Showcase. Uh, I think three years ago, uh, DigiPen submits uh, the games that they find to be interesting to Student Showcase and the IGF. We didn't make the the per, you know indie professional like guess uh, section, but we made it to the Student Showcase. Thank you. Hi. Um, how did the element of cake come into fruition? <laughs> so the question is, uh, how did the element of cake come to fruition? Uh, it kind of started off as like an inside joke, sort of. I mean, of. really, it just was one of those things. I think originally when we sat down, to, you guys were showing me the game. There was something about cake in there, and it just seemed like it's a comedy tool, obsess over one thing that maybe you wouldn't expect to obsess over, and, and we just, it really didn't have any deeper meaning than that. Yeah, we were just kind of having fun. Yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> fun, fun work, work fun, comedy yes, fun. Uh, yeah, yes, 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 yes. Right. We were working very hard yeah. and having fun. Hey, you keep it, you're like turning around to be sarcastic, it was hard work. Yeah, no, no, it was hard work. Working. I'm not done. All right. Jeez. Yeah. Conference is turning ugly. <laughs> Hey guys, uh, two quick questions. First, uh, was there any reasoning be behind making uh, like all the characters and the references and GLaDOS quotes and such uh, female? So the question is, uh, why did we decide to make our, our characters female, Gladys, and you know the main character? Uh, so uh, as far as the main character goes, uh, Gabe actually made a suggestion one day. Uh, we were at the time looking to, to find. <laughs> what we wanted, you know, to be the main character, uh, per 
protagonists of Portal. Um, and you can see like some of her, you know, earlier shots of the game. There's like a balding dude uh, as the main character, and that was just temp art. Like it was, it was something that we, you know, used a citizen model from Half-Life 2 and just kind of fixed him up a little bit and put him in just for our testing purposes. Um, but Anyways, Gabe, you know, came up to us while we were looking to figure out what we wanted our main character to be and said, well, why don't you make it a girl? And we're like, all right, sure. I mean, it really didn't stretch beyond that. It was sort of like, well, what if? Well, yeah, okay, like, why not? It's like post-feminist. It didn't even occur to us <laughs> not to make it a girl. It was no, <laughs> no big deal. And as far as GLaDOS, uh, well, there was the awesome GLaDOS pun, which kind of made it seem like we had to, it had to be female. But really, we knew an actress... I mean, casting is, is hard because uh, we knew this person was going to have to carry the game. So we needed an actress. Uh, or a, actor. Or, or actor. Actor or actress who, A, was good, and B, wouldn't be offended when, you know, the first third of our recording sessions were just us playing her text-to-speech and saying, say this exactly like that back to us because act actors hate that sort of thing. But she was, <laughs> she was super nice about it. And uh, so that, that kind of informed that. Okay, and uh, the other one is just to officially shut my friend up. Is Chell a cyborg? No, another failure of writing. Chell is not a cyborg. There's no, uh, she's not a cyborg. Except <laughs> those, those ridiculous shoes. Cyber shoes? Like, yeah, her, her future shoes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hey, this might have already been addressed at some point, but I got in late, so I have to ask anyways. Um, obviously, Portal was a very short game that met a lot of very popular success. Do you think this might start making a movement back towards the idea of shorter games being on the market? I mean, right now the huge pressure is, you know, everybody wants 20 plus, 30 plus, 40 plus hour games because everyone want to get uh, wants to get as much out of the game as they possibly can for, you know, what they're paying out of their wallet. Yeah, I mean, I... I'll, Oh, sorry. Uh, do you think Portal would influence more developers to make shorter games because, of the, uh, well, according to the questioner, people want longer and longer games, although I'm not 100% sure about that. You know, uh, everybody at Valve, all, all the people I know who play games who are adults now, the common complaint is they never finish a game. You know, nobody ever finishes a game that I know who isn't 14. They, they just, they don't have time, and also they have 40 hours a week to play World of Warcraft, too. <laughs> <laughs> Cuts into your gaming time. But, uh, uh, so, you know, there are some practical constraints on how long we were going to make it, but, you know, if we could have done anything, I really wanted to make a game that everybody who played it would be able to finish. You know, you'd, you'd be able to... It, it's weird to be playing these games or trying to tell a story in a game where almost everybody, it just sort of peters out. You know, you just stop playing at some point and never okay. finish it, right? Thank you very much. All right. Okay. Hello. Two-part question. The first part is, you mentioned that a lot of dialogue had been cut from the game. I was wondering if any of it had gotten recorded and or put through the process of being somewhat final for Gladys? And if so, is there any chance you could release it on one of your websites? Because as a member of the portal mapping community, we would give our eye teeth to have extra Gladys dialogue. So uh, the question was, how much of final dialogue got cut, and um, could we release it? So a lot, it wasn't a lot of final dialogue. Virtually mm -hmm. everything went through the text-to-speech as temp audio, uh -huh. and a lot of it got cut at that point. And some of the stuff that got cut, uh, I, you know, a lot of it I'm just not super proud of, so I wouldn't want to <laughs> give it to anybody. And some of it is good, and if it is good, I'm going to use it somewhere else, uh, hopefully. <laughs> Fair so enough. It, not to be... Uh, uh, not to be mean. Yeah, not to be mean, but probably the chances are somewhat slim. Uh, I had to try. Thank okay. you. <laughs> Thanks. Hi. Um, my question is, were there any considerations for making a multiplayer or cooperative experience? So the question was, were there any considerations for making Portal a co-op or a multiplayer game? Uh, yeah, we thought about it. Um, Actually, uh, the I don't know if we shipped this or not, but we played around uh, for a little while actually having like multiple sets of portals, and it is technically possible. Um, we just you know didn't really have the time to, to think through like what would the gameplay be that that was fun. Uh, you know, sort of the immediate conclusion that that we actually kind of tried a little bit was, oh my gosh, portals and deathmatch, and it's less fun than you think it is. 
uh, honestly. <laughs> it's actually kind of frustrating. So. Hi. You had a lot of really good advice about um, keeping it wet, keeping the project wet, not getting too attached to ideas, and being willing to cut things or make changes later. I'm just wondering how, what your experience was for balancing that with the need to get a project done and the kind of tendency of a project to kind of gain momentum the further it goes along and be harder to make changes later than earlier. So uh, the question was, how do we temper um, uh, a game, uh, you know, the, the longer you work on it, uh, the harder it is to, you know, sort of cut things and, and uh, I, is that kind of what you were saying? Yeah, okay. Yeah, you said it better than I do. Uh, and and uh, playtesting. Uh, you will know right away if your idea is good or bad. Um, you know, if, if you watch your players and they are just totally frustrated out of your mind and you can't really, you know, necessarily like pinpoint ways to fix it, then cut it. Um, because, uh, so, you know, one of the things that we do, making our, our levels at least, is we try and get them up and running once we come up with an idea, okay, we want, you know, such and such objectives. Um, as we try and get it up and running within like two to five days, like really, really fast, and then we start running playtests through it. And if we playtest it like maybe, you know, three or four times and we find that it's just really not working out, then it's going to the cutting floor or, or going back again to design phase and, you know, re remangling it to uh, work. So we never really got to a point where, you know, it was really, really difficult to cut something because, you know, we were always playtesting and, and getting reinforcement for whether or not our ideas were good or bad directly from, you know, people we consider our customers. Thank you. Yep. If your development team were, or your development process were a style of painting, mm -hmm. what would it be? <laughs> wow. So, if our development process were a style of painting, what would it be? Uh, uh, maybe, maybe a. a Gosh, I don't know. Yeah, cube, so that's a good cubist painting. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, you have a good one? Yeah, I'm out of material. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so, um, Chell obviously has a very good set of DNA. Uh, and you mentioned that it was Gabe's idea to make her female. And Gordon Freeman has good DNA. Is there any... <laughs> So the question is, are Chell and Gordon going to hook up, uh, essentially? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, you guys, you know, have access to Gary's mod, right? You can, you can do what you want. <laughs> yeah, I was wondering, um, you, you kept on talking about how you cut off a lot of things in the narrative and, like, cut off a lot of exposition and stuff like that and just really streamlined the process. And I was just wondering, do you think that it's possible, I mean, do you think it's, there's a way to make exposition and narrative, like, interesting and fun for the playtesters? And do you see what uh, I'm trying to get at? Oh, so the question is, uh, is, do I think there's a way to, I think you're saying, is there a way to include a lot more exposition and still make it entertaining? I mean, for me personally, I, somebody, I'm sure there's somebody who's a genius who could do it, but... I personally don't, th I mean, I, I like it when there is less, uh, you know, my own personal taste is less. Uh, so so for me, you, probably, probably not. I'm so trying to do, do as little that as possible. Games aren't good at telling, like, long expository stories then? Uh, yeah, I guess I'm, I'm not good at it, but I'm also not good at sitting through it. I mean, I just don't like it that much in games. When I, when I play a game... I, I like it to be as, as concise as possible because honestly, I'm a game writer, but I'm not even 100% convinced that games are the best medium for like telling epic long stories. Uh, I kind of think of what I do as more of like providing a film score. You know, movies aren't about the music, but the music is definitely an important part that enhances uh, the experience of watching the movie. So the writing is something that enhances the experience of why you're there, which is playing the game. And, and honestly, for me, there's something to be said for leaving things to people's imagination. You know, you don't have to have someone sitting there next to you dictating to you exactly what's going on at all times. Like, you know, people are smart. Give them credit. 
uh, you know, and I know for me personally, it's kind of fun just sort of imagining up, you know, what I think some, some of the storyline is. Uh, playing through portals, one of the biggest surprises uh, that I had was finding references to Black Mesa inside of it and then references to Aperture and the Borealis inside the uh, Half-Life 2 Episode 2. Around what point in development did you, know, you make the decision to, to drop portals into the Half-Life universe? Uh, so the question is, what, when did we decide to you know, sort of cross-reference in between the two games of Episode 2 and Portal? Mm -hmm. um, kind of like, you know, maybe in the middle of development or so? We, we well, middle of development for you, but <clears throat> I think when I came on, it was, that was in the, the earlier meetings. That was just one of the constraints on the game, uh, initially because I think they weren't sure exactly where they were going to position it, and also because we were still using a lot of Half-Life Half art. So it sort of made sense to tie them together. Um, as Portal kind of got its own identity, uh, we worried less and less about it. Like, you know, we're not going to have to have the G-Man appear or something, we can kind of make it a little bit more subtle and not have to dwell on it too much. Thanks. Uh, two questions. I, I have a friend who says that the best games teach us something. Uh, what do we have to learn from Portal? So uh, the question is, what do we have to learn from Portal because the best games teach people something? You want to take, take this one? <laughs> Tough one. Uh, well, I don't know. I throw that anybody, if anybody has an idea, just shout <laughs> it out. Trust yes. uh, don't trust, don't any trust anyone. Don't trust anyone. The cake is a lie. The cake is a lie. There we go. There's your cake. No, cake. no. I mean, I, we we definitely wanted to uh, explore the idea of, of manipulating space and, and thinking about you know a three D space in a different way. And so you know, throughout Portal, we're we're kind of teaching you to to look at a situation in a way that you haven't before. So I don't know if that kind of answers your question. It'll do. <laughs> uh, also, I noticed that the uh, companion cube was kind of silent. Uh, does, it any, does it have any dialogue in the sequel? Uh, so the question is, uh, <laughs> will a companion cube have dialogue in the sequel to Portal? I, I don't know about this sequel that you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> so this might be a little bit proprietary, but I'm curious. Um, how did you guys and or Valve figure out, or when did you figure out, or was it evolutionary process, how you were going to sell the game? So the question is, uh, when did we figure out when we were going, how we were going to, you know, market and sell Portal? Um, so when we initially started Portal, um, it was supposed to be like just a seriously short game, like maybe like uh, I don't know, 15 minutes, just like a quick temp tech demo. Um, and then, as, like the further we got. You know, on the game, uh, our constraints would you know change, uh, and I guess about the middle of Portal's development, uh, you know, we we had started talking about you know doing the orange box, and uh, it would just sort of seemed like a really reasonable conclusion that it, it should be packaged with other games uh, that you know have a lot of clout and are awesome games, and and you know from our standpoint, like that's that's great, you know. Um, we like, we're, we were seriously honored to be packaged with you know TF2 and, and Episode 2 because we think they're truly awesome games. So. You said that you used the playtesting as kind of a method by which you tested whether or not the players got the storyline. And I wondered, as the game length grew, how, when you compartmentalize the testing, because grabbing people for 8-hour or 10-hour play sessions isn't always possible, did you get them to give you that feedback even if they're only playing maybe one or two levels? Uh, well, a lot of that. Oh, sorry. Uh, how did we get people to experience the entire story uh, if they didn't play test the whole game? Luckily, because Portal was a pretty short game throughout most of its development, you know, at no point was it so long that it would take people eight hours to get through it. Uh, that Please don't hit me in the face. Sorry. <laughs> the um. Uh, what was I going to say? So if somebody didn't finish the game, we weren't super worried about asking them. We did occasionally have playtesters who didn't make it through, but most of them, we, we sat and watched them for the entire time, and they made it through. Um, I know that this question has kind of been beaten to death a bit, but uh, it was about uh, storyline, uh, you saying uh, uh, less is more. Would you say that that, that that policy applies to like other genres besides just Portal, or you know, is it just like mostly for that type of I mean, niche? there's definitely... Uh, oh, uh, is less is, does less is more in terms of story apply to other genres? And again, I don't know. I don't have a, 
a, a surefire solution for every genre. I mean, in terms of my enjoyment of a game, less is more. So, uh, but again, if you're making a giant RPG, you probably need to say who begat whom and <laughs> where the where the hammer came from. So Portal and Half-Life 2 have a very different tone in terms of the writing and the, the um, sort of themes, the thematic elements. Um, if you ever do try and tie the universes together and do something with the cross-referencing you've done, do you have any ideas for how you might resolve that? Well, uh, so how do we resolve the differences in tone between Half-Life universe and uh, the sort of Aperture universe? And actually... It was something I thought about, and I, I honestly don't think it's that big a problem, because the Aperture universe, the tone that you're seeing, is mostly GLaDOS, right? You're seeing things, even though you're playing a character, you're actually kind of experiencing the world through GLaDOS's eyes. And uh, so if Chell is out in the Half-Life universe, no action that you took as a player is really in direct contradiction to... Uh, anything that would happen in the Half-Life universe. Inside the sort of Aperture Science Funhouse, there's a different set of uh, maybe tonal rules. Phys Physics-wise, they're the same places, and, and even art style-wise. So I'm, I'm not super duper worried about it. Is that Paul? Yeah, it is. Paul. Um, is there any chance of an art book? Uh, say that again, please. Is there any chance of an art book? Uh, is there any chance of an art book? Uh, I don't know. I haven't talked about it with anyone, but uh, it's an interesting idea. Yeah, they, they're talking about it. I think it would be more of an orange box sort of thing. Um, uh, most of our concept art, honestly, was Jason Brashel designing the uh, the Gladys battle, which there's some awesome, awesome artwork, which you can... There, there's actually a print, I think, that you can buy of it. Um, or look at on the website. Yeah, or you can look at it and print it out. <laughs> But uh, a lot of the other stuff, there. I mean, compared to TF or Half Life, the there isn't a lot of really awesome uh, concept art. I mean, we've got a lot of thumbnails of stuff, but uh, like there aren't a whole lot of like really, you know, great, uh, you know, pictures that we have. Uh, you know, Rachel did maybe uh, like maybe six or so, but uh, essentially, you know, we've just got a lot of thumbnails of you know the turrets and and the gun and. And a bunch of other stuff. Um, also, why are the portals ovoid? So the question is, why are the portals ovals? Well, ovals look better than rectangles. <laughs> uh, you know, we wanted we wanted something to, to kind of fit the bounds of where the actual, like, you know, where you can pass through the portal to be. And so we kind of just filled a, uh, an oval, you know, through the rectangle uh, where the portal, you know, technically is. Uh, the game alludes to a lot of backstory that isn't really fully explained, like the fact that you're a test subject for no explained reason. How much of that backstory is actually written and referenced to, and how much of that did you just sort of like say, or oh, we'll let the player kind of use his imagination? Um, so the question is, how much uh, backstory is there uh, that isn't in the game? And there, there's a fair amount. There's a lot. There's a I, uh, a lot of, I don't know, there's probably a 15-page document about Aperture Science. There's actually a little bit of it is on the Aperture Science website, kind of hidden in there somewhere. And uh, I had written up a bunch of stuff in the beginning just to kind of help me. And actually, at that point, I thought maybe I'd get more in there. But, uh, and, uh, and I sent it to Jonathan, too. That kind of helped him get into the sort of mindset of the whole thing. But, yeah, there, there is a bunch. Hi, um, I think uh, I speak for a lot of people on this that uh, Portal really was a huge triumph because it was so creative and it won you know, so many awards and it's got so much acclaim um, and it's so different. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit on how you think that's affecting the community of games as a whole. Uh, so the question, so it's like how Portal impacts the community of games yeah, as well? Yeah, and, and uh, the approach to, to making games as a creative medium. Um, I don't really know. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of too early to tell. I hope it, I mean, because since we made Portal, we made a game that we sort of like. So if more people make games like Portal, I would probably, I will probably like them. So that, that's good. <laughs> uh, but, I mean, you just look at it this year, it seems like the independent games are 
getting really gr awesome. Awesome, yeah. They're they're higher production quality and also higher profile. So maybe it'll mean people take risks on you know uh, more oddball games. Good evening. Hello. So uh, I had a question about uh, in terms of. Like um, my background is film and, and that sort of media, so my question to you as writers and developers of this game is: What are your influences? What, what did you look like? What did you think of as inspiration for Portal or inspiration to get into the game industry? And you know, how did that influence how you attack this game, this project? So uh, the question was: uh, Do we have any influences uh, that kind of inspired us to to make Portal or get into the gaming gaming industry? Um, so for me personally, like every other person on the planet, you know, Miyamoto is definitely an inspiration. Um, you know, I grew up with Nintendo games, and and I was kind of raised on them. So you know, from an early age, like you know, I wanted to be a game designer. Um, and, you know, uh, as far as just kind of interesting uh, games that actually get published, you know, Kat Katamari Damashi was a really great one. Do um, you have inspiration? Oh, well, direct inspiration for Portal uh, was uh, there's a book by, uh, who's the Dune guy? Frank Herbert. Frank Herbert called Destination Void that was, uh, it's about people that, clones that go into space and they're tasked with building an AI and there's always like this fail-safe mechanism because the AIs always go crazy and kill everyone and they, uh, the crew doesn't really know that that's what happens and then they blow up the ship and it just fails and fails and fails because the, the AI goes rogue and they blow up the ship. There's, there's like one mole guy in there who knows that he's supposed to blow up the ship. So that was an inspiration for that. The game industry, I just... Oh, okay. Uh, no Isaac game. Asimov or anything like that, or uh... Uh, not, you know, I, I'm honestly not. When I was a kid, I read a lot of science fiction, but I don't read a lot of science fiction now. So, but I mean, I know Asimov. I'm sure indirectly, Robert Sheckley is. A, we actually named a character in episode two Sheckley after Robert Sheckley, just because okay. he writes kind of funny science fiction. Yeah. So I always, when Great. I was a kid, I loved his stuff. Thank you. Thanks. Oh, you know what? Just because uh, we have to catch a plane at some point, so these, if we can just do these. Three and then and there's nobody else, so that that's easy. Hey, I have a question specifically for Eric. If the portal design process was an animal, what would it be? <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, Anna, who used to sit right next to me at Double Fine. So uh, that's that was her joke question. I'm not going to answer. <laughs> okay, so uh, my question it pertains to the current slides. Slide, <laughs> uh, yeah, we were actually waiting for, for someone to actually ask us what in the world do we put on the slide. <laughs> what's the significance of the two shots? And if, if you were each one of the characters in each of the pictures, <laughs> which would you be? <laughs> Eric's the one crying. <laughs> I don't know, it's, just, it's friendship and... Uh, <laughs> And fire. Uh, two pictures we just had, we couldn't quite fit into the talk in any meaningful way. Uh, so, and they, we thought they were pretty funny. I think uh, one of those is my, the crying guys is my Steam community ID, too. And that's Rudy Ray Moore. That's so awesome. Hi. So um, I was actually wondering about the development team. Um, because you're female and that's kind of unusual, um, how many girls are on the team? So uh, the question was how many girls were on the portal team? Uh, there were two, uh, myself and uh, one of the artists, uh, Realm Lovejoy. Right on. Um, do you think that that helps in the creativity process and making like a unique game, having that different perspective? Uh, so the question was, you know, does having females on a game team, uh, you know, make for a better game, giving you a, a unique perspective? And uh, I don't know. Um, <laughs> No, I mean, honestly, I, I think, you know, whenever you're, you're on a game team, team, you know, no matter what your gender, you want to make a game that you would enjoy to play yourself. Like, that's the dream, right? So, I mean, I, I guess that, that could, you know, by extension mean that we made a game that perhaps, you know, girls could like too. But, you know, honestly, it's, I, I hope that it's fun for everybody, personally. Having girls on the team makes the room smell better. 